Hello, this is Tim with another unboxing video. Uh, sim racing titles again, just like the last one with uh, Jeff Crammond. Uh, this time it is Papyrus Racing Games. They started off in 1988, 1989 with the um, Indy 500 simulation you can see on the left. And uh, they ended up with um, NASCAR Racing 2003 season. And uh, that was their final title before the studio was actually shut down. Now, there's a couple of titles in here that really wasn't by them, but it was connected, and I'll explain when I get to them. Um, those are uh, Soda Off-Road Racing and iRacing.com. Um, so I think I'll actually start off with Indy 500, obviously, and uh, take you through. I'll probably spend a lot more time on the titles that, were, that meant the most to me, the same as I did with uh, Jeff uh, Crammond. And... Um, could probably spend a little bit more time on the older titles as opposed to the newer ones as well. Um, but hopefully you enjoy. So here we are with uh, Indy 500 The Simulation. This was Papyrus' first title. Um, it was also the first title where uh, uh, David Kamer was actually credited. Um, it was also co-written by um, Omar Kudari, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, who was the co-founder of Papyrus. Uh, this is an Amiga version, uh, still sealed, so I'm not going to open it for the purposes of this video. Um, but you can see the graphics there, which are actually from the IBM uh, PC version, not the Amiga. Um, like I said in the uh, Jeff Crammond video, it's not unusual for boxes at this point to show screenshots from a different platform. And. Uh, these two here show the um, TV cameras, the replay view. This is not what you saw while driving. Uh, this is what you saw while driving. So I'll just show you the text here and um, you'll be able to pause if there's something that you want to read that uh, I'm moving too quickly away from. Might be difficult to read through uh, this kind of cellophane. And uh, I remember on, on the Amiga, with the, with the re-release that I got here, um, it uh, worked on 512k of, um, of RAM, but uh, if you wanted music or replays, you had to have one meg. So this was the re-release, this is what I actually played, played the most. I also had like a Sports Legends um, pack, which had like a golf game and Indy 500 in it. and. Um, that uh, that was the one that kind of got me in the most trouble. Um, to kind of explain what I mean by that, well, I uh, was late for my French exam, my GCSEs, when I was at school um, because I was at a friend's house playing Indy 500. <laughs> so that gives you some indication of where my priorities have been in life since I was a teenager. Um, I actually walked in uh, about 15 minutes into the exam and uh, consequently, I uh, I think my grade was an E, so it was a passing grade, but it wasn't um, a grade that you could use to get into college or anything like that, so I had to rely on my other subjects. I didn't really like taking French anyway, but, uh, <laughs> but it gives you some indication of, you know, um, where this product fits into my life is that basically I was at a friend's house playing Indy 500 when I should have been taking an exam at school. Um, so let's have a quick look at this uh, paperwork here. I assume it's fairly fairly uh, similar still in the sealed copy, but um, if not, uh, someone can maybe comment and highlight that. Um, command summary card, it's just basically um, a shortened manual. You possibly can pause and read these uh, if you're on um, HD viewing. So this uh, manual is for both PC and Amiga. And there you go, you can see uh, Omar and uh, David. And um, some information about them. have a, a good flick through the manual here. Um, 
Something I remember about Indy 500 really was um, the setups. I, I um, spent a long time kind of trying to learn about setups and was, was really never really effective with it, um, especially with the March and, and the Lola chassis. Um, the Penske seemed kind of out of the box, just faster. Um, so most of the time I would just use the Penske and make very minor changes with the car setup. I didn't really understand what I was doing, even though the manual tells you I, I was a teenager and just didn't get that. Um, so yeah, there, there, there was three different chassis available. One was blue, one was red, and one was yellow. The yellow one was the Penske. And, uh, the manual takes you through some really interesting things, obviously contact patches uh, due to uh, pressure, uh, stagger. This was my first encounter with Stagger, by the way, was Indy 500. I um, had watched racing for a long time, not really very much IndyCar, because IndyCar didn't really get famous until Mansell went across um, in the UK. And uh, it's interesting here, they're showing what understeer and oversteer is. I never really had oversteer with Indy 500, ever. I don't know if it was the physics engine wasn't capable, or whether I never adjusted my setup to make it oversteer. Um, but basically it never happened to me. I, I would always either run wide into the wall or um, obviously slow down and make it around the turn. I, I never lost the back end. So, um, these here were used for um, piracy protection, basically when the game started up you would be asked about um, someone's speed when they when they won or something similar to that and uh, if you entered the right amount obviously the, get the, um, the game would load but it's also interesting just to look at these and see the progression of um, racing cars racing at, in, at Indy obviously the switch between front engine rear engine um, and then obviously the introduction of um, wings so there we go let's look at uh, Indy 500 let's just show you the um, text on the back of this one and, and the screenshots just so um, you've seen them without cellophane all over them you can see the graphics um, fairly basic kind of wireframe um, uh, obviously green for the whole of the grass section, grey for the for everything else, uh, white walls, um, speckled crowd um, of all of the other colours available and um, obviously explosions and contact were marked by um, different coloured triangles that uh, that and the, the sound effects were really kind of funny. I, it was um, Basically different levels of beeping um, signified different things. The engine itself was a, you know, like a constant beep. Whereas the, um, like any any crashes, it was kind of, <laughs> uh, it was so hysterical. But um, yeah, that was state of the art back then. Absolutely state of the art. The replay system was really good too. It was the first time that I'd ever really encountered that. Um, I don't really recall it being even this good in some later racing games. So, that is Indy 500. Now, these two here I consider to be um, largely the same software engine, um, largely the same kind of era of development. Um, and this is obviously IndyCar Racing 1 and NASCAR Racing 1. It's uh, one of the main reasons that I consider them to be very, very um, similar developments is how similar they actually looked in terms of uh, the, the graphics. And you can see that, you know, there's uh, Quite a quite a step from Indy 500, the simulation where there's uh, this texturing on the cars rather than solid colours, texturing on um, advertising billboards, the track surface itself. Um, yeah, so it, quite a 
quite quite a leap, really. But uh, yeah, these these two are very very similar in terms of the engine that, that they'll have been using for um, physics, for graphics, everything. So, but let's look at the first one first, which is uh, IndyCar Racing, and um, look at the front here. Good old Mario. On the side here, that's uh, what the cockpit looked like, which actually is very similar to um, how things looked on um, Indy 500, the simulation. And obviously, it's a similar type of car. They didn't change a lot. Uh, pr progression for Indy cars kind of seemed a little bit stagnant. Um, in the early 90s. And here's the specifications required. This is PC obviously. Uh, 386DX with 25 megahertz or greater, 4 megs of RAM. And uh, at this point they were still showing you how to make boot up disks for, for games. Um, as I explained in the, the, the Crammond video, um, you would run Windows and um, Windows would take up memory that you needed for your game so you would make a startup disk that went straight into the game and uh, bypass Windows entirely. And uh, Interesting at the top here it says um, first in a series which um, that kind of language would lead me to believe that at this point they'd already licensed IndyCar for maybe a two game deal And uh, this is one of the really cool things about um, uh, both this and NASCAR 1 actually, is that when you went in, into a setup um, area, they're obviously looking at, at the, the front shocks, it would take the bodywork off and show you the front shocks when you were actually in the, the uh, garage uh, changing them. There was eight different tracks. Uh, quite amazingly it was missing Indianapolis. I assume that was a different um, license, and uh, surprisingly, they didn't get it. Maybe they were under uh, um, an exclusivity agreement or something. So let's have a look at this text. Obviously, you can pause to read if I go too too quickly. I like these quotes at the beginning though, um, easy to begin, hard to win, years of fun. <laughs> so, there we go. Let's have a look inside the box. Awesome manual, again, I'll spend some time on that. I actually have two copies of um, IndyCar Racing in the same box here, so don't, don't be confused. Um, installation guide, reference card, okay. 1993 this was released, so uh, three to four, four years after development stopped on um, Indy 500, the simulation. Now these are native to this, uh, to this box. Um, Three uh, three point five inch HD floppies, and this is not native to this box, but this is another copy of um, IndyCar Racing. And uh, obviously, uh, you can actually see IndyCar Racing two advertised in the IndyCar Racing 1 uh, CD, but obviously that this came about pretty much after this had. Um, so let's have a really good look at this uh, manual now. Obviously the same image as uh, the front cover of the box on the front and uh, just the address of the company in Somerville, Massachusetts. I'll spend some time 
looking through this manual because uh, these old manuals are just fantastic. Yeah, we actually used to have to calibrate our joysticks. That's something that uh, a lot of people don't ever have to do these days. Where um, you know you would literally have to go into an individual game and actually calibrate how far it turned one way, how far it turned the other. Um, yeah, it's crazy. But this game. Um, had a lot going for it. It had uh, testing and practice and single race and championship and everything. It was missing a lot of the tracks though as far as I recall. Um, most notably Indy. Profiles. The sad thing is that um, I think at least a couple of these, I don't think N Nazareth even exists anymore. Portland might still exist, but it's barely used as far as I know. This is um, interesting, I actually remember the first time I really learned about contact patches and how um, the grip changes um, depending on the contact patch was from this. And uh, basically it um, shows those contact patches and it shows that under, um, under acceleration uh, larger contact patch on the back, smaller on the front, so it's um, it's it's kind of harder to turn when you're accelerating, if that makes sense. Because um, obviously the car wants to, wants to push straight because you've got less of a contact patch. Um, and then while while you're braking, it's easier to lose the rear. Um, you know, you can lose the rear because of you know locked wheels or anything of that sort, but you can also lose the rear simply because there's less rubber on the, on the uh, on the racetrack and um, kind of interesting it was at this point I realized there's actually a lot more to racing than it looks like on TV because I've been watching uh, racing my whole life and um, Obviously, with IndyCar specifically, I only started watching it when uh, Mansell came over. So, yeah. There we go. I think um, I think this was 1993 that this was released. Um, but uh, amazing title, R really, really was. It uh, probably got Papyrus really established, and you can see their old logo there. Just thought I'd point that out too. Um, so let's look at um, NASCAR Racing One. Well. The interesting thing about this one is that I had not heard of NASCAR before I bought the game. I bought NASCAR Racing because I bought IndyCar Racing. And um, it's a sad thing with licensing that uh, a software developer has to pay Chevrolet. You know, to put a Chevrolet in the game, they have to pay Chevrolet. Um, to put NASCAR in your game, you have to pay NASCAR. Um, and uh, it's such a sad thing because the benefits of actually being in someone's game are just enormous. You, um, I hadn't heard of NASCAR before I played a game based on it. 
and I have been a NASCAR fan ever since. What does that tell you? It tells you that they should see game development as um, free advertising and uh, should work with game developers. So, there's my personal tirade. <laughs> and now I'll carry on looking at the box. Um, obviously, very nice design, really. It's, you know, quite visual. Uh, especially this bit at the top, it um, frames the box quite nicely. Uh, obviously, you can pause if you want to read any of this, if I'm going too quickly for you. Specifications for this then you have a 3860x 33 MHz and 6 megs of RAM, uh, and it runs in 4 with uh, reduced detail. And the SVGA specifications, I am not sure if I believe because I remember trying SVGA on a much more powerful system than it's listing here, and um, it killed my system. <laughs> but oh well, it could have been anything really. Um, but it looks like just a tiny, tiny increase in um, C CPU requirement compared to NASCAR Racing 1, and that was probably simply because there was more um, computer cars. Obviously, um, I think this had 30... Because it, it definitely didn't have 43 cars. I think it had 38 cars um, total. Um, and I spent a lot of time editing NAS uh, NASCAR 1 as well. I uh, did quite a few offline championships and uh, would edit the the AI based on the results that were in the previous week's Autosport. Obviously instructions to make a bootable, a bootable floppy are still in here. That's um, what I was talking about earlier with the lack of memory when Windows is running. The keyboard reference. And this is a bit of fun. Um, Thrustmaster inbox advertising for the Formula T1. <laughs> I should probably scan this and send it to my contact at uh, Thrustmaster so he can have a good laugh. Um, NASCAR Racing CD. The interesting thing with um, with this as well is that it was missing tracks, uh, quite a, quite a few, if I recall. And um, Indianapolis uh, was actually being used at this point, but they didn't have that, and they didn't have um, Daytona either. And I remember with um, like championships and things, I would. Uh, run Talladega twice, I, I would make up my own um, season by editing the files and uh, I would put Tal you know, Talladega in for wherever Daytona was used and obviously it's 1994, it was the first year of, um, of uh, them running at the Brickyard uh, th and this is version 1.1 as well so before this there was probably some other releases that had various issues and they were fixed up and put out uh, with this. And, uh, quick look at the inside. And, um, what's interesting, you can see Jeff Gordon there, who the really interesting thing about that is that 94 was, I think, his first full season. Um, and I think he won at the Brickyard. And he was chosen for the box art, which very, very surprising. You know, you would think that there would be like an established star. I think at this point, Sterling Marlin was in the four. Maxwell House. I think that might have been the 88. That might have been um, Dale Jarrett, maybe. But, uh, anyway, this is another awesome manual. 
and uh, I'll try to get a decent angle so you can at least see something. It's, it's not going to stay open for me. Obviously, again, you know, you can pause if uh, you want to read any of this, which hopefully in HD you can. <laughs> Using your radio and obviously the F keys with a radio. So yeah, I spent a lot of time on this game, probably more than even NASCAR Racing 2, um, and certainly more than NASCAR 3, 4, and 2002. Um, basically, I think uh, development moved too quickly between the NASCAR sims after NASCAR 2, and um, I never really had the time to use them before the next one was out didn't stop me buying them though, which is probably why they kept doing it. <laughs> and this is where the whole um, the whole negativity about uh, F10 came in. Because look at that word there. Arcade! <laughs> oh dear, and the sim racing community still hasn't let go of that one. As I said in the um, the Crammon video, you know, a lot of people cannot just come into a racing sim and control a race car. They need to gradually build up, turning off aids to be able to get better. So, someone coming in using driver aids is not a bad thing. A, sim a simulation that has driver aids is not a bad thing. It's um, logical. Quite nice um, track profiles really. And then uh, advice on how to actually drive them. some history of uh, NASCAR. The paint shop is something that um, we did all try to do and all failed. Um, really wasn't uh, very easy at all. Uh, a huge amount of copyright notices at the back there. <laughs> uh, licensing platform. So that is NASCAR Racing 1. So for my next uh, group I have IndyCar Racing 2, NASCAR 2 and the NASCAR 2 expansion pack for the Grand National Series which is now called the Nationwide Series. Um, these two are actually the same game they're just um, a, a, a re-release after the IndyCar and uh, Kart or Champ Car split. Um, NASCAR 2, this is obviously an add-on, uh, but NASCAR 2 in my mind it's a very similar engine um, to uh, what was used in IndyCar Racing 2. Um, and uh, you, you can, the same way as with NASCAR 1 and IndyCar 
um, IndyCar one, you can kind of see that with the engine, with the graphics. Um, so I'll go to IndyCar 2 first and uh, show you these boxes, which um, are obviously the same title. Um, it's, it is literally just, just a rebranding, uh, a few icons moved around, um, which, you know, you kind of wonder why, but, um, and there's a, there's a couple of situations where I think, um, I think one sponsor had stayed with a particular series, so they'd obviously removed Pennzoil and put Papyrus there instead, and just, it's, Kind of silly, really. <laughs> um, but uh, the information that's on each one is exactly the same, so I'm just going to get rid of kart racing to the side here, and uh, let's have a look at the IndyCar Racing 2 box. Now, um, it says quite clearly on the front of the box there that it's for Windows 95 and Mac, um, which is quite interesting. I don't really know if previous products or later products were for the Mac. Um, NASCAR 2003 did get a uh, Mac version, but it was by a company called Aspire, uh, rather than by Papyrus directly. Um, let's see, I still have half the cellophane on this one as well. Um, let's have a look at the side of the box. A quote by. Um, Robbie Gordon on the side. And uh, from Computer Gaming World on the other side. So let's have a good look at the back of the box here. Very nice design and uh, Part of me wonders if it's because the um, the indie cars of this era just looked gorgeous, you know. So I'm my brain is saying that the whole box looks great based on that. And here, obviously, 15 tracks and. One of the things that you'll notice is actually missing, um, even from the Champ Car and the IndyCar uh, ones, is that Indianapolis is missing. And uh, it was only with about the time that um, IndyCar Racing 2 and NASCAR 2 came out that I got the internet with um, uh, uh, dial-up that um, I actually started to find out that people were doing modding so I actually did have a, a, an Indianapolis mod for um, for this game. I'll um, show you this text and as always you can pause and read see that? Using Apple's Plain Talk speech recognition technology, you can communicate with your pit crew. That's something that I obviously never used because I never had a Mac at this point. But uh, you can see a uh, quite a large step forward in the graphics. Very large, and comparing that to. Um, NASCAR 2, it's it's about the same step forward. So that's why I grouped them together, is because I think they were generally the same engine. So I'll just open this up and we can have a look inside. Okay. Here we go. Stonking great big manual in this box that uh, foremost puts um, the Grand Prix 2 manual to shame. But uh, first of all, here's another Thrustmaster advertisement. This time for the Formula T2, which is obviously more catered towards um, NASCAR, which uh, 
makes it really confusing as to why it's in the IndyCar box, but this is the one it came in. And support information. Reference card. Reg uh, registration. The massive manual, which I'll come back to. Um, technical supplement. Still at this point, there will have been instructions on how to make a startup disk, I believe. Um, Windows 95 and even Windows 98, I still had to run a lot of games in DOS. You can see the advertisement for NASCAR racing on the back of the um, CD here. Show you the inside. That's what the CD looked like. Version 1.1 obviously, so um, I'm not sure if it was the first version released or whether I got a later copy or anything like that. So here we go with this awesome manual. Um, Good flick through here, and uh, I'll try to do it slowly because this is such a great manual that I'd like you to see it. Now, what, one thing that's interesting while we're looking through this manual is that this was the era when uh, graphics card wars began. And um, you'll notice that the earlier version of IndyCar Racing 2 um, didn't have a rendition logo on the side of the box, whereas the kart racing box did, even though they're the same game. Um, things had actually progressed to the point where um, you could actually use different graphics cards now with, with, with games and um, this was great in one sense but it also kind of split your customer base up as well um, so you know it was a double-edged sword and then you know the, the, the main issue is that games very very rarely shipped with the actual support for the graphics cards you had to go and find them but you know it's uh, something that we all lived through. There was kind of direct draw and things like that, but the, I don't think direct X existed really in any major form until sometime after Windows 95 was released. Calibrating joysticks. There you go, there's a good example of um, the fact that we had to calibrate joysticks within games. Um, it wasn't just something that Windows took care of, or that even, even these days, you know, you just plug them in and they just work. You don't really need to do anything as far as uh, calibration. Here's um, some of the graphics. Um, changes that you could make. Oops. <laughs> Minimum frame rate of 13 frames a second. Okay. This here, there's a guide on improving your frame rate, and I think a lot of people still these days. Um, don't realize how important frame rate is to their driving experience. I think it can feel like a completely different um, set of physics for 
a racing simulation, if you have a poor frame rate, your brain um, can't really calculate what's being sent at it. And um, I honestly think a lot of people run uh, settings that their system just can't cope with, and uh, then they have a completely different opinion of um, whichever simulation it is because of that. Which is a shame, really. I think people that have lived through this era, we um, we we realise that you know at, at certain points you you might not actually be able to run a game maxed out. We've all been through it with this with this era, especially where um, sometimes you were lucky if a game even ran at all. Um, without you having to mess around and or use DOS instead of um, Windows, you had to work at it a lot. And, uh, good explanation here of understeer and oversteer. I definitely did have situations of oversteer in um, IndyCar Racing 2. So I think the physics were capable of that, but again, you were still stuck to the the uh, the surface of the world. You couldn't um, actually leave it. There was no kind of airborne situations. So there you go. There's that manual. Um, did I look at the system specs? I'm not sure I did. We have. If I can get it to actually focus. There we go. Um, we have a 486DX with 33 megahertz, 8 megs of RAM. That's what it's asking for as the minimum. And then if we compare that to NASCAR Racing 2, 486, uh, 66. So it is actually quite a step up in the minimums, but again, that could just be because of there being more AI. Um, I, I don't. I really cannot say that there was a big step in graphics because I don't think there was. Um, so here we go with uh, Dale Earnhardt on the cover. I think that was Dale Earnhardt, Terry Labonte, um, Jeff Gordon, uh, Ricky Rudd at this point. I think maybe in the tide car, and uh, for some reason I think that was Johnny Benson, but I could, I could be completely wrong. Um, so, let's have a good look at the cover here. Um, 16 tracks, 1996 cars and drivers. It was still only 38 AI, I believe. It still wasn't a full 43. And, uh, I used to really like these on the the games, you know, you could actually see what you were buying on the shelf without kind of just trusting the back. So, yeah, there you go. I think they worked with um, Bobby Labonte and uh, Joe Gibbs Racing Team for a lot of the physics in this one. Uh, um, painting seemed a lot easier in NASCAR 2, I can't quite remember why though, but um, I think eventually there was a, I could be confusing NASCAR 2 with NASCAR 3 as far as when Di uh, DirectX came in. Um, so this is something that's interesting is that 
I actually did try the Enros um, demo with NASCAR Racing 2, e even though I was in the UK. Um, I actually joined in and uh, I think I had a ping of like 300 or something. Um, so I was probably pissing everybody off that I was there, but it was my first multiplayer experience in a racing sim. It was with uh, NASCAR Racing 2. Okay, here we go. And as you can see, I actually have a couple of copies of NASCAR 2. Um, so I'll put one of them up there. I think that's everything that's duplicated. Um, Alright. So here's the CD. Same uh, cover as the box. And uh, advertising for Red Baron 2. And uh, Sierra Pro Pilot. Obviously looking after the... Um, Simulator uh, crowd quite a bit there, Sierra. There is the CD and the manual. I will come back to, but look how thick that thing is. Um, new uh, support documentation. Here is um, a wheel that some of you may have had, the Thrustmaster NASCAR Pro Racing Wheel. This was the, actually just uh, the manual for the wheel, this wasn't with the game. But, uh, while I've got it out, I'll flip through this as well. There we go. Um, Thrustmaster were pretty big in... Uh, Sims forever really and I think they kind of they lost their appeal a little bit but it seems like just lately they've really got it back a few quality products here and there that's all it takes really I wonder if that's supposed to be a warthog stick similar to because um, I've just actually got the new version looks very similar Yeah, it's really interesting seeing all this. I had no idea that um, Thrustmaster was so uh, visible at this point. I guess I completely bypassed this at the time. <laughs> Shows you how well advertising works then, right? One hour of insider tips. So this is for the video. So th there's an hour-long video. Um, I think I saw a book. Maybe I'm just dreaming that. Um, installation and troubleshooting guide. Uh, more Thrustmaster stuff. Here's a keyboard. Reference sheet and <laughs> oh dear, we've got into the graphics card wars. Um, so you need a special executable file in order to take advantage of the rendition hardware. <laughs> oh dear, I remember this era. Um, you had uh, rendition, you had um, 3DFX that both went by the wayside, that were both used in Papyrus Sims registration card again. And uh, let's have a look at this manual. I'll try to take my time on this one too, because I think uh, a lot of you will be quite interested in this. This might be you know, your first Papyrus Sim, for example.
A lot of setup adjustments that you could make in NASCAR 2. A lot of them, um, it made uh, the racing kind of more about the setup than about um, anything else, really. I uh, remember reading a lot about the online racing because I didn't have enough money to spend on the, on the bills to be connected to, to do it too much. Um, I remember reading and reading about it and uh, basically it was all about what setup you had. And again, as far as the physics were concerned with um, NASCAR Racing 2, it was the same as IndyCar 2, where you couldn't leave the track surface. You know, there was no um, um, situation like that. Uh, physics were definitely limited that way. But it's not like this was the only um, game that was like that. I think... Uh, Jeff Crammon's Grand Prix series was like it for a long time as well. And when you did go airborne in Jeff Crammon's Sims, it was strange explaining the draft here. That's NASCAR Racing 2, and obviously the same product. Um, we have the NASCAR Grand National Series expansion pack, which required NASCAR Racing 2, so it was an add-on for it. Um, you could buy a 50th anniversary edition of um, NASCAR Racing 2, which included it, I believe. I do not have that, though. Um, so, let's have a look here. Obviously, it added a bunch more tracks, which um, I was very grateful for at the time. Two fantasy tracks. That was the source of. Um, there's one called the Bull Ring, I think, and then uh, was it the Coca Cola track? Maybe. And, uh, basically, it's it's largely the same game um, just a few kind of adjustments on uh, graphics and stuff but um, the new California Speedway uh, which is obviously called um, Fontana was quite a nice addition Ninety-seven drivers, cars, and teams race for the National Grand National Series Championship. Ten new tracks plus two uh, fantasy. Uh, Texas was added as well. I wonder if they actually, because um, Texas was reprofiled, I think, after its first race because it had um, you know two different levels of banking, um, and I think you actually got the first one where it was two different levels of banking which was caused a lot of crashes yeah there you go Bull, Bull Run Raceway which was one of the fantasy tracks you can see it on the right there Uh, this is listed as 1997. Now, as far as specification changes, I don't really know if there was any. Nope, doesn't look like it. Um, both are 486, 66 megahertz, 16 megs of RAM. So, yeah, both the same specification, which I think kind of confirms that there was no real kind of changes, it was just an addition um, in content. And uh, this is still sealed too, so I'm not going to open it, but um, 
you've seen the box. So here we have Soda Off-Road Racing, which although it's not strictly a, a Papyrus product, it was actually developed by um, a company called Software Allies. It sort of is a Papyrus product because um, it was developed by, um, I think, Sean Nash, who uh, were closely um, connected to the Papyrus guys. Um, both of those brothers actually work for iRacing now, which is the same place that um, the founder of Papyrus, uh, David Kamer, ended up. Or the last thing I knew, they both worked for iRacing. I, I, I don't know now. Um, but here's a uh, good look at this box, which it's, it's definitely the new style kind of Sierra uh, box that you'll see on a couple of the other um, Papyrus products shortly. Um, and I mean the physics on this were really quite impressive um, it was uh, 1998 was the release the same year as uh, Grand Prix Legends which I'll show you shortly and uh, there was some really kind of interesting stuff about this um, one of which was the the track editor and uh, you could design your own courses and then you could actually share them with other people and uh, I think that's awesome. It's really one of the first kind of modder support features that um, that a game really had in there. And I don't think Soda really gets the recognition for that that it should. Um, but maybe now it will. Um, specifications here: uh, Windows 95 as a minimum. So you needed Windows 95. Uh, a Pentium 90, 16 megs of RAM, um, a Windows compatible sound card. Um, so really, we're, we're starting to move now um, in in terms of gaming into Windows 95 support only, where DOS is completely forgotten about. Um, and you know, really, we should. You know, this is 1998 now. It's it's three years after the release of Windows 95, obviously, and. Um, as soon as Windows 98 Special Edition came out, there really wasn't any reason to not have Windows, in in my opinion at least. Um, so yeah, let's uh, look at that. Let's look what was inside the box. And I have the unofficial strategy guide for Soda Off-Road Racing. Complete st statistics on all 12 off-road tracks. And do you see that logo? Ha! <laughs> there you go. Um, <laughs> told you it was connected with Papyrus, didn't I? So let's get all of this out of here. Um, so here's the uh, CD, which is broken, obviously. Um, And uh, it's advertising a fishing game by the look of it, and NASCAR Racing 1 on the back of uh, this CD. Okay. And the All-American Sports Series is um, obviously the branding on this Sierra box, so uh, that's what they're working to advertise. And um, you have obviously NASCAR Racing there off-road racing so this was quite you know a publicized product really and, uh, let's see what's being said about uh, soda off-road racing and uh, according to this you could actually buy them together which I never saw obviously I was having to import most of my games as well Go. So let's have a look at this enormous book here, uh, written by Mark Walker, but uh, I'm not really aware of anything else he might have written. Oops. And like I said, the physics for um, 
for this game were absolutely stunning. Um, I there's not really even now many off-road games that have actually bettered it. Um, it's just a shame, obviously, that graphically it um, doesn't look as impressive anymore. It's kind of the same as Grand Prix Legends in terms of being way ahead of its time. And uh, hopefully showing it a little bit of love in this video, it'll open people's eyes up to the fact that this game existed. It's um, an incredibly, incredibly good game. An incredibly good simulation, even. And uh, d don't get me wrong about the graphics, they were fantastic for the time. And um, did the job, certainly. The tracks were very small, and uh, that probably helped with that. Sorry if my hand's getting shaky, I've been holding up this camera for a long time now. I think I might uh, <laughs> take a break after this one and uh, record the rest of the video at a different time. I mean, look at the graphics there. It's fantastic. There we go, Sean Nash. So Software Allies was Cindy Kendall and Sean Nash. There we go. So um, Scott Nash uh, does work for iRacing as well, but maybe he wasn't really involved with Soda then, um, as I thought he was. And, you know, I did used to work for iRacing and uh, when I first met Sean, you know, one of the things that was talked about and I talked to him about um, was soda off-road racing. I mean, I had a lot of respect for it at the time, and I don't know whether a lot of the sim racing community actually do now. Um, it was one of the first titles to really support modding, and the physics were, like, actually came along before Grand Prix Legends, and in my opinion, were as advanced for what they simulated as Grand Prix Legends was. And, you know, you can see that Papyrus were involved, but when I worked for them, you know, I, during the actual discussion and everything, I know that they, um, they assisted with the development, but basically this was a one-man deal. You know, this, this, this was, um, just software allies and Papyrus essentially assisted. Um, I don't think this game got the attention or the appreciation that it really deserved. It has a really important place in the history of racing sims and in many ways Papyrus themselves um, <sighs> overshadowed it. Um, but, you know, we can look back now and Hopefully, if you didn't know about it, now you do. So, uh, next up, Grand Prix Legends.